what an awesome way to begin our service today. Well, good morning, church, and welcome to worship with our first Fairhope family of believers on this first Sunday following Easter Sunday. Of course, the truth is, for us as believers, every Sunday is Easter Sunday as we get to worship our risen Savior week after week after week and on for eternity. If you're our guest today, we'd love to know that you're worshiping with us, and we want to ask you to simply take out your phone right now and text the word welcome to the number you'll see on our screen. And we'd love to get in touch with you at some point in the days to come. Now at this time, let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship as Mike Kilpatrick comes to lead us in prayer. Join me in prayer, please. Father God, this is an unusual situation for us. But Father, we know that you have not been caught by surprise, that you've got a plan and you've put it in place and we just need to trust you. Father, we come to you this morning asking for your presence to be with us. While we're not all gathered here physically together, we're gathered all over this city and county and state and country and the whole world, Father for the single purpose of worshiping you and bringing glory and honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we spent this past week reflecting on that resurrecting Sunday. I heard uh, a song that just stuck in my heart and my mind that it's all about the cross. The writer of that song reminded us that it's not about us. It's not about the good things that we do. It's not about treasures or trophies we've won. It's not about buildings we've built or crowds we have. It's about the cross. It's about our sin. It's about how Jesus come to be born once that we could be born again. Every drop of blood that flowed from him should have been from me. It's about that stone that was rolled away so that we could have a real life someday. It's about the cross, Father. Father, may every song we sing today, every word we speak, point someone to that cross, the only place that we can become connected to you. Just as Moses prayed after he came down off of the mountain, Father, and you directed them to head toward the Holy Land. Moses stopped and he said, Now therefore I pray, if I have found favor in thy sight, let me know thy ways, that I may know thee, so that I might find favor in thy sight. Father, that's our prayer today, that we may know you more, that we might find favor in your sight. Father, we ask your blessings upon our pastor and our church staff. Give them your divine guidance to lead us through these troubled times in which we live. We also ask for you for blessings upon our state and national leaders. We pray that they will seek you and you will provide them your divine direction to lead us through this coronavirus crisis we face today. We also ask for healing for all those afflicted with this or other Ill illnesses. But Father, we're so reminded that death has no victory over your children. The Apostle Paul said it best in Romans, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, not any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We love you, Father. We thank you for your love. It's all about the cross. It's about your love nailed to that tree so that we could have real life someday. It's about the cross. Thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We invite you to join your voices together. And I'm hearing that some of you are singing at home. Some are a, a little uh, hesitant to sing in front of your family members. Turn up the volume and then just join in with us. We sing a song that is your answer to God's will. Yes, Lord, yes. Sing with us. I 
Yes.
I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built on forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When it waves rise, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world in all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound, for they walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long and in your righteousness, they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, and our King to the Holy One of Israel. In staff meeting, Ryan Smith was talking about the COVID virus, and he was asking if there were things that we could be thankful for or we could praise God for. And it was ironic because just the night before, Tony and I were praying before we fell asleep, and I realized that it was the first time that I could really thank God of a, on a, for a journey that I'd walked through. You see, when I was 33, I was sitting in a hospital room with my husband at the time, and he was being told by the doctor that he had colon cancer. And I was introduced 
to someone for the first time that I would take around with me. And it, that someone was fear. And it was heavy and it was real. So we're facing colon cancer with four young children, but we decided we were just going to do what we had to do to get through it and trust that the God was in control. And so we went through the year of chemo and radiation. And when I was 35, I found myself in an oncologist's office sitting beside Wes again when that doctor told him that he had six months to two years to live. And the fear was overwhelming. I was petrified. It was something that when um, I fell asleep, it was the last thing I felt before I fell asleep. And when I woke up in the morning, as soon as I became conscious, I recognized that I was afraid. It was a, a, not a welcome visitor at all. And so I decided then that I didn't like living in the prison that I had put myself in of fear. And I started searching my Bible for Bible verses um, that dealt with fear and that dealt with peace and, and healing. And I wrote them on three by five cards and I carried them around with me everywhere. I vividly remember sitting at the drive through at McDonald's in Eufaula, Alabama. And as I'm waiting for the Happy Meals to be handed out the window to me, I have that card and I'm flipping through these verses. Well, whenever the code, um, the, this virus came around, I kind of pushed back. Um, I didn't take it seriously. I um, really didn't get afraid until I was in Walmart and I got a text message from two different friend groups saying that they were going to close Walmart and all the grocery stores and the gas stations. And then later on that week, I had someone um, speculate they were going to shut down the interstates. Now, none of that happened, but we did start hearing shelter in place and um, all kinds of people saying, don't go out and wear masks. And, and the fear was real. And I kind of pushed back from that because of the lessons I learned earlier. Because you see, when I was 37 years old, I found myself once again in a hospital ICU room and was waiting with friends and family for my husband to take his last breath. And while it was a beautiful time and it was a, an emotionally sad time, I honestly can tell you I wasn't afraid because God had brought me through so much and taught me that He is trustworthy and He can be nothing more than trustworthy and that He is faithful. And I can lean into Him in these hard times. And so whenever I felt this virus fear coming around, it almost made me angry because I did not want that to be um, the way I handled this. I really believe that God is doing something and we've heard it. All of our pastors have said it. People that you, friends that you know have said it. God is doing something to get our attention. From the beginning of this, my heart has been burdened that we are supposed to make a kingdom difference. And the way we're going to do this, believers, is we're going to have to approach it different than the rest of the world. We can't cave to fear. So how can we not cave to fear? How can what the way we live be inviting and contagious? And the, and the way we do it is to recognize, number one, that when we walk through the fire, God goes with us. And... And number two, that even though we can't predict what tomorrow's going to hold, we never could. We don't have any control over what tomorrow brings. But we can choose to, to have faith. And, and Paul told us in um, Hebrews 11.1, 1, he said, Faith is the confidence in what we hope for, and it is the assurance of what we cannot see. So what I'm going to do and what I'm hoping all of us as believers are going to do so that we can live a life that is inviting to the rest of the world is I'm going to trust in the one who is trustworthy. I can't tell you why you're walking through this valley and I can't tell you how long you have to stay and I can't tell you why your heart feels so unsettled or when this all will change but I can tell you there's something you can lean on 
It's a promise that won't bend and it won't break. It'll keep you when the future isn't certain. You're not out of grace. When the darkness overwhelms you and the fear just won't subside, when your questions outweigh answers and those long and lonely nights, friend, you've got to keep on moving. He is with you in the valley of despair And He won't leave you there He is with you when you think you just won't make it He is right there when it looks like hope is lost Well friend, you're gonna find out He's nothing less than faithful, so keep holding on, keep holding on. When the darkness overwhelms you and the fear just won't subside, when your questions outweigh answers and those long and lonely nights, that you've got to keep on moving, He is with you. The valley of despair, and he won't leave you there. He won't leave you there. And if there has never been a moment, there will never be a day. He's not strong enough to rescue, he's not strong enough to. darkness overwhelms you when the fears just won't subside when your questions outweigh answers and those long and lonely nights friend you've got to keep on moving he is with you testimony that you just heard from Lorraine, she shared the story of how she moved from fear to faith. She shared with us that an unwelcome guest had entered into her life during a time of crisis. Fear was an ever-present reality, and she came to recognize that a choice needed to be made. And the choice that she made was a critical transition point, and in it is a lesson for us that jumps off the pages of scriptures as we look once again together at the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to direct your attention to Luke chapter 24 because what we're going to see in this chapter is the same transition, the same journey that transformed and filled Lorene's life with wisdom. What was it that brought her from fear to faith? What was the critical feature of that journey? If you remember, as Laureen shared, she was in a place of fear, and then she made a decision. It was a decision to go to the Word of God. 
And that's what I want to communicate to you through God's word this morning. During this strange season, strange season in the life of our church and nation and world, you're going to have an opportunity to make some adjustments. And one of those adjustments that's going to be critical in your spiritual life is a fresh commitment to filling your life with God's word. And so we're going to look at some resurrection encounters. And what you're going to see, especially in Luke's gospel, is that when we first are introduced to these disciples in this chapter, we find them afraid, perplexed, confused, and then something happens, and then they are filled with joy and excitement and peace. And every single time in these three encounters that we're going to look at together this morning, the critical feature is the Word of God. Look very quickly at Luke chapter 24, verse 8. This is just outside of the empty tomb. The women have come to see Jesus. They are afraid. They see these uh, angels. They're contending with the fact that the tomb is empty. And then Luke writes, they remembered his words. Then they remembered his words and everything changed. Two disciples are walking along the road and they meet with Jesus, but they don't know that it's him. And in verse 27, Luke writes, Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, Jesus explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. They remembered his words. Jesus explained the scriptures. And then finally, a meeting of Jesus with his disciples. They're still struggling with what it means for Jesus to be alive. And then in verse 45, Luke writes, then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. What I want you to see in this passage today is that God's word is the key that unlocks resurrection realities. God's word is the key that unlocks resurrection realities. If you would say during these weeks that you have battled with anxiety, fear, or other overwhelmingly negative emotions, and you'd like to make that same journey that Lorene made, the Word of God is the critical feature. God's Word is the key that unlocks resurrection realities. I want you to see three things in these encounters this morning. First of all, the living Word creates new worlds. The living Word creates new worlds. When we meet these women... In the very first verses of chapter 24, Luke writes, On the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they didn't find Jesus. And they were perplexed about this, overwhelmed with fear. You see, when we first meet these women, they're in the fog of earthbound expectation. They're in the fog of earthbound expectation. They go to the tomb on that morning as a part of their duty. As women, as followers of Jesus, he's now dead. He's supposed to be in that grave, and they know what they're supposed to do. They are living in the natural world, in old world realities. That is what they are looking for. That's what the angels will ask. What are you looking for? Whom do you seek? What's your mindset? And in these first verses, these women are trapped in this fog of earthbound expectations. And here's the deal. If this world, the natural world, the old world, is all the world there is, it's the only thing that there is, then the Word of God is dead. The Word of God has no effect. The Word of God is forgotten. It's irrelevant. Because the Word of God, the truth of God, resurrection reality speak of a whole new world, a whole new transformed existence that's characterized not by death, but by life. And when they remember the words of Christ, they remember His promises of life. 
And the fog of earthbound expectation is dispelled by the light of the living word. He's not here. He's alive. He's risen from the dead and their eyes are opened to the fact that there's a whole new reality, a whole new existence. Death, Paul says, is swallowed up by victory. And this is the power of the word of God. It brings dead things to life. It exposes the emptiness of the old world, exposes the emptiness of our old existence and the word of God brings us to life. One of the verses I want you to pay attention to throughout the rest of this sermon is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And in that verse, it begins by Paul reminding us that all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. In that term that Paul essentially creates, he speaks of something that harkens back to the very first chapters of Genesis when God breathes uh, on, on uh, the first man and he becomes a living being. That's what the word of God does. It brings dead things to life. And that's the story of the scriptures all the way through from Genesis where God creates the world through his word all the way to Revelation where his word and his spirit bring the new creation, bring the new Jerusalem. It's the story of Israel that's picturing Eden brought back to its original intent and in fact brought to completion. And all of that culminates in the mission and the life and the purposes of Christ to bring the promises of new creation, breaking right in to the old realities and the old ways of seeing things. The living word creates new worlds. That's the power of God's word. One of the ministries here at our church that I stay consistently thrilled about is called Gideon's International. You may be familiar with it. If you've ever been in a, in a uh, hotel room, you'll open up the, uh, uh, the drawers there, uh, maybe in the dresser or the bedside table, and you'll find a copy of the Word of God. And it's the Gideons who leave them there, and they live, leave copies of the Word all over the world, millions and millions of copies of God's Word. And the testimonies over the years of how just the word of God transforms lives are unbelievable. One man tells the story of reading his Gideon Bible that he'd been given in prison. He was pulling some of the pages out to roll up cigarettes. And he said, while he was smoking Leviticus, he was reading the gospel of John. He didn't know anything about God's word. He had never had any exposure to the church or the message of the gospel, but just by reading the scriptures, he was completely changed. And now he's a preacher of the gospel. It's another story of a, a little boy born into terribly difficult circumstances, surrounded constantly by abuse of every kind. And then he went to school. He was put in the special ed classroom because he stuttered so badly. The abuse just kept him so stunted in every area. And then a faithful teacher gave him a Gideon Bible, a copy of God's word. And she started using that Bible to teach him to read. And he started to learn the promises of God and how God felt about him. And he was transformed, brought from death to life. And now he's a preacher and a bishop and a leader in the church. Another story is told of a woman who was in a hotel room when attackers burst through her door to do her harm. And as they uh, wrestled about in the room, the bedside table was turned over and out tumbled one of those Gideon Bibles. The woman managed to, to wedge herself underneath that bedside table and open up God's word to the book of Psalms. And she began to read the word of God to her attackers. And after a half a chapter or so, the men who were intending to do her harm fled the room because the power of the truth of the word of God. That's what the word does. It brings dead things to life. It intervenes to bring whole new kinds of realities and truth. And so again, that's Lorene's story. She was trapped in a world of fear. And then she remembered, I'll go to God's word and it changed everything. 
Maybe your story this morning is Bible reading for you is kind of non-existent. It's, it's never been something that you've been able to do or comfortable doing or, or disciplined to do. It may be because fundamentally you're kind of fine with the world the way that it is. You've insulated yourself from the brokenness of the world and, and sort of told yourself that things are fine the way they are, even though they are most assuredly not. And very often what the Lord will do is he'll allow a crisis to enter your life to remind you that this world is not your home. And if you come to recognize in the midst of this crisis that this can't be all there is, then I would challenge you to go to God's word. It is God breathed and it will bring you to life. It'll bring your marriage to life. It'll bring your family to life. It'll transform your relationships. It'll give you direction and sustenance and it will point you to whole new possibilities that are characterized by the supernatural. The living word creates new worlds. Secondly, we find in Luke 24 that the Lord's word crafts cross-shaped worlds. The Lord's word crafts cross-shaped words. The next interaction in Luke 24 are the two disciples that are walking along the road back to Emmaus. Basically, these disciples of Jesus have been disappointed by his death and they are going home. Emmaus was a hotbed of, of um, nationalism and resistance against the powers of Rome. And so these men were really looking for Jesus, someone who would fulfill their political agenda, someone who would get involved in their game. They were trapped in the fog of egocentric expectations. They were fine with Jesus as long as he fit in with what they were looking for and what they wanted to accomplish. For them, the word made flesh was to be a magic word or a spell that would, would operate according to their wishes and their vision. Look at verses 19 through 21. Jesus meets them and he talks to them, but they don't recognize him as Jesus. And so he says, what things are you men talking about? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word, and in the sight of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. What they share with Jesus is we had a particular view of what Jesus was going to do. He was just a prophet. He did all these wonderful things and he was going to be the one to redeem Israel, to kick out all of our problems and to give us what we want. And as long as they looked at Jesus that way in the fog of egocentric expectation, they couldn't see Jesus. Verse 16 says their eyes were prevented from seeing him and they're prevented by these egocentric expectations. And Jesus will say to them later, verse 25, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 26, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter his glory? In these disciples' minds, they couldn't comprehend a crucified Christ. They couldn't comprehend a suffering Messiah. Those things didn't go together, and so they couldn't see Jesus. But then Jesus, verse 27, beginning with Moses and with the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. And so... He walked these disciples from Genesis to Revelation, helping them to understand that it was necessary, it was necessary that the Christ should suffer. The Bible teaches that from beginning to end. In Genesis, 
when the problem of sin enters into the world, there's a promise of one who will come, who will crush the head of the serpent Satan, and at the same time will be stricken in the process of laying his life down. In Exodus, there's a Passover lamb. In Deuteronomy, uh, 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 there in, or in Numbers, uh, there's, the, there's the serpent that's lifted up, bringing salvation to all who will look. In Deuteronomy, there's a prof- promise of a word that comes down, uh, a word that comes up from the dead, uh, a word that enters in and transforms and changes. In Joshua, that, uh, uh, that name is Jesus' name, Yeshua, and he is the one uh, who runs to the problem when everyone else is running away like Joshua did. He's the one who says, I don't care what everyone else is doing, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And then through the history of the Old Testament that culminates in David, we find one who is willing to go into the valley and confront the enemy and bring freedom to the people of God and to pursue the nations. And the rest of Israel's history is the story of their failure to be this sacrificial people that God has called them to be. Yet in the prophetic books, the promise of one to come, a suffering servant, one who will receive into himself the wounds that were due everyone else. That's the promise of the prophecy of the Old Testament. And even in the wisdom literature, Jesus is the wisdom of God, not a worldly wisdom, not a man-made wisdom, but a wisdom that comes on high, a wisdom that answers the sovereign command of the Lord with obedience and sacrifice and service. And from beginning to end, there's a promise, a cross-shaped promise of this one who is going to come, who's going to lay his life down, making the appropriate sacrifice, the one who's willing to suffer. The suffering of the righteous is a message of the scriptures from beginning to end. And what Jesus does is he reminds these men of the truth of the scriptures that they say they believe the Christ must suffer. That's how he saves. Look at verse 31. It says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This was when Jesus broke the bread. I think that's such an incredible picture. As they come to recognize the broken Messiah, the one who willingly allows his body to be crushed, they come to see Jesus for who he really is. And their eyes are opened as they understand the scriptures that say that the Christ must suffer for us. And he calls us into that same kind of life. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that this God-breathed scripture is profitable for teaching, for conviction, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Here's what God's word does is it conforms us to the image of Christ. It teaches us about who he is. It teaches us and convicts us that our way is wrong and his way is right. It straightens us out. That word for, uh, for correction is, a, uh, is the same word we get orthopedics from. He takes broken things and he sets them straight and conforms them to his shape. And then he trains us in these things so that we can come to live them in our day-to-day existence with commitment and consistency. The story of the scripture is the story of this savior who lays his life down. The story of the scripture is not one who comes along and helps us do all the things that we wanna do but he is this one who comes and redeems us, who reveals to us that what we wanna do on our own always takes us in the wrong direction. And he receives the punishment that we deserve. And he calls us forward into this whole new way of living, the sacrificial life. This is the story of Christ. And sometimes it's difficult to recognize because it doesn't fit easily into what we want to do. Years ago, my youngest son, Jake, came home from vacation Bible school with one of his crafts. And uh, uh, it was a, a picture that he had drawn, but it was a little bit strange. It was a squirrel with sandals on. And so I asked Jake, uh, what's, uh, what's the deal with this drawing from vacation Bible school? And Jake said, well, it's a picture that started out as Jesus, but it wound up being a squirrel. 
We run into those problems sometimes. It's, it's hard to, to envision Jesus. And, and sometimes we want to start out trying to understand him, but eventually we, we draw him into the shape that we want him to be. And yet the message of scripture is that the crucified Messiah, though he runs against the grain of our expectation and our agenda, the crucified Messiah, he's the center of the whole story. And we know this to be the case. Fundamentally, every story that we tell is some form of a redemption story. When you break every story down to its common denominator, there's a big problem. And then the right sacrifice has to be made. And then redemption comes to all people. That's in all the stories we tell. Either that's done successfully or it's done unsuccessfully. But we have a deep longing for redemption as the result of sacrifice. And that's the message of the Bible. And that's the story that gives shape to our life. A cross-shaped existence changes us redeems us, and then it points us uh, to a future that rests in the full reality of who Jesus is. And so today, your Bible reading may not be what it needs to be. You may need a renewal in your love for the Word of God because you either don't understand or you don't like the plot of Scripture. The point of Scripture is to point you to Jesus the point of scripture is to make you more like Jesus. Every single book tells that story from beginning to end. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures that all of the prophets were speaking about him. When Jesus is at the center of who you are, Jesus is at the center of your passion and affections, then you're gonna have an awakening love for the word of God. And you may wanna do like that man did in the Gideon story. Just start with the gospel of John. Get to know Jesus. And then he'll anchor your reading of the rest of scriptures, of the scriptures as God points you to a cross-shaped world. The living word creates new worlds. The Lord's word crafts cross-shaped worlds and the limitless word captures lost worlds. That's the last thing that I want you to see. And the final uh, interaction of Jesus with his disciples, uh, that takes place uh, uh, beginning in verse 36. But I want to point you to, to verse 44 of Luke 24. Jesus is, is speaking to these men and, uh, we're, and go on up to verse 41 because there's a very interesting passage of scripture here. Jesus uh, appears to these disciples. They see him as the resurrected savior. But look at verse 41. Even though they've seen him, they've seen his hands and his feet, his nail pierced hands and feet. Verse 41 says this, while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement. They still couldn't believe, really believe in the resurrection power of Christ because of their amazement, because of their joy. This is, a, this is an incredibly challenging verse, but I think the answer is clear enough. They are trapped in the fog of what I'm calling exiguous expectations. You know, I can't get through a sermon without using one of those $60 words just because uh, I'm kind of a nerd. And so uh, I want to give you the word exiguous. I also need it to fit in with the rest of my sermon outline alliteration, but exiguous is a good word. It means trifling or incredibly small, insignificant. And here's what's going on in this fog of exiguous expectations. The reaction of the disciples to their master being alive is just relief, Whew, they say. We're not gonna die. Our hopes have not been completely crushed. We're gonna be okay. Everything's gonna work out for us now. 
And in that moment of really thinking kind of small about the significance of the resurrection of the dead, they're still missing the full significance of resurrection power. They've got small expectations. Yes, Jesus is alive. Yes, he's the crucified and resurrected Savior. But that kind of mainly applies to me. And those expectations are dispelled by the light of the limitless word. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 44. Now he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And this is crucial, verse 47. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Jesus speaks not only here of his death and resurrection being a fulfillment of the scriptures, but he also speaks of the proclamation of this good news to the whole world as the fulfillment of the scriptures as well. Again, this takes us all the way back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, where Abraham receives a promise that he'll become a great nation and that through him, through his people, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This new world doesn't come. Resurrection realities are not fully on display until everyone is heard about this good news of forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ and him alone. And that story that begins in Genesis of all the nations being in the, in the heart of God, that takes us all the way to the final chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, where the nations are streaming into the new Jerusalem. And it speaks of the Garden of Eden being restored and a great tree being there that has leaves for the healing of the nations. It's not uh, it, merely that Jesus saves us but he saves us for a purpose that pushes us to bring this good news to those who have not heard it yet. Luke will go on uh, to write the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter one, he speaks again of this call to be witnesses of these things. That when we really understand the joy of knowing the Lord, then we share that joy with others. And the book of Acts ends in Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31. The, the book of Acts ends after all these things that are being done in the church and for the church and through the church. Luke's story in Luke and Acts of the coming of Christ and the birth of the church, that whole story ends with these words, that the gospel was preached unhindered. The gospel of the kingdom is being preached unhindered. That's the point of the word of God. That's the promise of the word of God. And so 2 Timothy 3, 17 says this, this God-breathed word that cleans us up and straightens us out and gives us a Christ shape, that is all for a purpose that we would be equipped, every believer would be equipped for every good work, that we would have the things we need to do the task that we've been assigned. You can't stay in the tomb. It's what the angels tell these women. Tells the men going uh, back home, you can't go home and just do what you were doing before. Glad that you've met Jesus. And then he tells these disciples at the end, you can't just have joy and relief that, that good news of salvation has come to you, but you really have believed and you've really been transformed and you've really been filled with convictional joy when that is a message that you wanna to take to the whole world. Several years ago, I found myself in North Mississippi at a breakfast with an Ethiopian from Addis Ababa 
named Abraham who had come to the United States to work on some different aspects of his education. It was quite an unexpected meeting at that little uh, breakfast restaurant there in North Mississippi. And it's a pretty interesting story of how it came about. How would there be an Ethiopian who's come to North Mississippi to meet with a preacher who was born in Texas? Well, a critical point of that story actually took place in Norway. A man named Hans Nielsen Hauge was an ordinary farmer in the late 1700s, pretty poor, very ordinary guy. And one day when he was out in his fields doing his work, he was completely transformed by a filling of the Spirit that overwhelmed him with a love of God and a passion for those who didn't know the Lord. And so this uneducated man began to preach, began to travel, call people to a fresh, deep relationship with God through the power of his word, that they didn't just need to sit and, uh, in church and let someone else tell them about uh, what God's word was all about, but they needed to read and know God's word for themselves. And if they knew it, they would want to share it. Eventually, followers of how you heard the mission call. They heard the call to take good news to people who hadn't heard it yet. And some of those Scandinavian missionaries made their way all the way to Ethiopia and they preached the gospel and churches were planted. And generations later, an Ethiopian named Abraham heard the gospel in one of those churches, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and entered into a journey that would take him all over the world as he preached the gospel. That's how God's word works. God's word captures a lost world, lost people like me in Texas, lost people like Abraham in Ethiopia, and points all in between and everywhere. To really know God's word is to be set on mission by the word for the world. Again, that's Lorene's testimony. What the Lord has taught her through the crisis of losing her husband, it trained her on how to go to God's word in the midst of fear so that when she walked into this most recent crisis that we're all involved in, she had learned to live in the reality of a cross-shaped life. And it's her belief, even in the midst of this hard thing, that our life should be an invitation to the world around us. They should see us as people not overwhelmed by fear and that what God wants to do during this time is to reawaken and re-enliven the word that we say we believe so that it speaks out of our lives and transforms others around us. Maybe if you don't have a deep passion for the word of God, maybe if your Bible reading is really pretty paltry, it could be because you're not really interested in the mission. You're not really interested in the mission. Yes, Jesus is alive and yes, he's come and saved you and you've got your spot in heaven secured. But somehow you missed central, the central message, which is that that transforming word to you is to be spoken out of your life, that you become a minister, that this truth that fills you with hope instead of fear can be the truth for someone in your circles of influence, influence that does not know that word quite yet. That's what the word of God does. It captures lost worlds. Is this God's word for you and, th and, and in you and through you for the world? God's word is the key that unlocks resurrection realities. Is this God's word to you? Would you bow your heads with me? Right where you are in your homes, would you be willing just to bow for a moment and do some business with God's word? Would you recognize this morning that God has stopped the whole world so he could speak to you, and draw you back to his word?
Maybe you've always struggled with a consistent interaction with the word of truth. Maybe you just need to pray this prayer. God, breathe your word into me. Bring me life. Maybe your prayer needs to be, God, I've come to recognize that I'm spiritually dead and I need the life-giving breath of your word, your gospel for the very first time. Lord, come in and save me, forgive me, fill me, bring me to life. God, let your word be a life-giving word to me. Maybe a commitment you can make this morning is, God, I have not been faithful to be a passionate student of the scriptures because I, I've resisted the fundamental plot line that through it, you're calling me to the cross. You wanna shape my life in the shape of Jesus so that you can use me to bring hope and joy and peace to the world. And so this morning, I say yes to your word. I say yes to your savior. I say yes to your mission because your word is the key that unlocks these resurrection realities for me. If these are your prayers this morning and you'd like to know more about what it means to pursue the Lord Jesus and the power of his word, we would love to share some of that hope and that truth with you. You'll see a number on your screen and you can text your decision or your need to us we want to be the hands and feet of Christ to you because we believe that God's word is truth. So anything that you might need, if you're just struggling, if you don't have this peace, if you don't have this freedom from fear that we've been talking about, we want to talk to you because God has a gift of his presence and his word that he wants to give to you. So if you've got a need that we can help meet, please share that with us. You can do that through text. You can go to our website. We wanna to talk to you and bring you some encouragement during this season. I pray that the truth and the power of the resurrection of Christ will be yours in an unprecedented way as we walk through this time together. The Lord's blessings on you on this Lord's day.